What happens after death to those not united to Christ by faith? At the day of judgment, they will receive the fearful but just sentence of condemnation pronounced against them. They will be cast out from the favorable presence of God into hell to be justly and grievously punished forever. Oftentimes, people, Christian, non-Christian alike, believe that the Old Testament presents a God of wrath, a God of anger, a God of hell and judgment, whereas the New Testament presents Jesus Christ, meek and mild, ready to forgive, ready to include, ready to reach out to the marginalized and the oppressed. Nothing could be further from the truth. What we find in the Bible is that God is holy, God is just, God is even jealous, we're told, from his very lips. And yet God is loving, God is merciful, God is gracious. God is the kind of being who decides to spend eternity with murderers and adulterers and idolaters, with the very people who crucify his son. That's a strange thing, and that's an odd combination. But what we see as we read through the Bible is that it's not the Old Testament wherein we find the most startling, shocking portraits of judgment. Judgment's there in the Bible, but it is most often on the lips of Jesus himself. New Testament scholar Don Carson has pointed out that as you read the gospel accounts and you listen to Jesus teach about who he is and what he does, he ratchets up the intensity of two things, the promises of grace in the gospel and the terrible judgment for those who don't respond in faith. It's Jesus who in Matthew 25 tells us that there will even be religious ones, purported followers of his, nay, even leaders and significant public figures known for their acts of religious devotion and their ministries and their service to whom Jesus will say, depart from me. I never knew you. We see two things in that line. First, that the ultimate issue in terms of where we spend eternity is that we be known by Christ. Jesus isn't speaking simply of cognitive awareness or intellectual apprehension, but of knowledge in a profound relational sense that the Bible often addresses, using the term to know, for instance, as a metaphor for even sexual intimacy in marriage. Jesus does not know these people in that profound, intimate way as one who's identified with him, united to him by faith. And so what we see is that those who are to suffer judgment, wrath, and hell are not simply sinners, but ultimately sinners not united to Christ. They're not being united to Christ, though, secondly, means they must depart from him. As unholy ones, as unrighteous ones, as those ununited to Christ by faith, they cannot be with the life-giving one. They cannot enjoy the fullness of his smile and the delight of his presence. Psalm 1611 tells us that in your presence is fullness of life. That joy, that pleasure forevermore, cannot be experienced by the one who justly deserves God's wrath and apart from Christ receives God's eternal damnation. The Bible does address hell, judgment, and its eternal implications. It perders forever. It doesn't involve total alienation or removal from God's presence, what would that even mean? To be completely absent from God would be to cease existence, for in him we live, move, and have our being. But it does mean to be near God in all the wrong ways, to be in his presence in a way that is harrowing and horrible, not joyful and delightful, not comforting and life-giving. Hell is presence in the sheer terror of God, not 
the glorious life-giving joy of God. Hell, in other words, is precisely what Jesus endured on the cross. He didn't cease existing. He didn't go out to a reach where God wasn't, but he was forsaken of God. And so he screamed out, not my God, my God, I've stopped living, not my God, my God, where are you? But my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? For those of us united to Christ by faith, that's done and there can be no double jeopardy. He endured the wrath, the God forsakenness that I deserve. And by faith, I'm identified with him and the life I now live, I live by faith in this son of God who died for me. His death was my death. His life is my life. For those not united by faith to Christ, that day comes, and God forsakenness will be real. The Bible uses terrifying images to point to the severity of the struggle, the, the lake of fire, for instance. The point is not that this is a literal physical description of what shall be experienced. The point is this is the most terrifying thing we can imagine, and surely experiencing God in all the wrong ways will be far worse. It may not involve a hot lake that burns away your skin, but it will involve that experience. It will be terrible. It will endure forever, we're told. It will be precisely the sort of affair that Jesus has promised to do in your behalf. And so one of the terribly frank descriptions of the Bible is the severity of judgment. Because one of the completely honest assessments of the Bible is the just desert of our sin. And this can be met, this can be satisfied in only two ways, in ourselves or in a substitute. And for those who will not seize the substitute by faith, the Bible does speak, Jesus does speak more insistently than any other, that there will come a day and there will be a time when God will honor our decision. Will God re respect our responsibility? When God will bring judgment upon those who've refused in darkness to receive the light.